Yes, my name is Dr. Ganesh Taylor. I don't normally go with a full title, but I thought for this talk, I would actually state that I do have some modicum of professional experience. Um, that said, the title says the contraception delusion, and I'm not a professional expert in contraception. What I study is how it is that embryos actually make the decision to build ovaries versus testes, okay? So I study biological sex, something that many people I think don't know or don't think about, even biologists often don't think about this, is that biological sex is kind of multi-layered. That's the best way of putting it. At the point of fertilization, technically this schematic is a bit of a loop, right? So it, fertilization is the moment where an egg and a sperm meet for the first time, okay? It happens in your mother and it's all beautiful. There's not actually songs that happen at that point in time. Angels don't actually sing, even though we might think they do. At that point in time, your DNA, your genome all comes together for the first ever time, okay? And really importantly, in that moment, your, your DNA, your genome has these sort of volumes one might think of, these things that we call chromosomes. And of them, there are two that are very particular that we call sex chromosomes. So at that very first point of fertilization, the very first time your genome comes into existence, you have something that we call a chromosomal sex, okay? So that's like, you have these chromosomes, this is what you have, this is the hand you have been dealt. And 99.9% .9 of people pretty much across the planet all get either XX or XY. And that is sort of the first layer, that's the foundational layer. Okay, so, you know, one cell embryo, it divides, it develops, it, you know, there's a few, all of them that happens, and then, you know, you need a bit of materials to start with before you start building an entire embryo. But then pretty early on in the proceedings, about eight weeks, six to eight weeks of human development, so six to eight weeks after fertilization, there's a lot going on. The embryo is being built, there's head, there's limbs, there's, you know, there's a rough structure going on, okay? And, and during that time, there's a structure that's built that is actually a bit of a mouthful to say. It's called the bipotential gonadal ridge. And we biologists often like to label things um, very literally, maybe the Germanic roots of, of science have got something to do with that, I, I wonder. But that thing, as the name indicates, has two potentials, bipotential. That same structure can be reshaped into either testes or into ovaries, which I think is pretty bloody amazing, um, considering the fact that it's the literal same cells. Can we just take a moment to appreciate that, right? So the schematic is here to really highlight that. If you think about it, there's this generic structure made up of these supporting cells, and then, and then thanks to the DNA on the sex chromosomes and other bits of DNA in the genome, this incredible molecular mechanism unfolds that basically ends up telling this generic structure, oh, right, hey, we have a Y chromosome, we are gonna be making testes, this supporting cell precursor then matures up to becoming a supporting cell. It reshapes this organ into a load of tubules. They're all designed to interconnect to, to house a particular group of cells called germ cells. Um, and germ cells are the cells that will um, eventually become, if they come to live in a, in a testis, they, they become uh, Sertoli cells. They become stem cells that will make um, that make basically sperm, right? So the germ cells are the, the, the cells that will make the sperm. But if those germ cells come to find themselves in an ovary rather, they will then become um, egg cells basically, all right? So there's two really important cell types. There's the germ cells, they're the ones that will become eggs or sperm. And then there's the supporting cells and the supporting cells reshape this thing. So as I said, these, these supporting cells become one of two very different things and they reshape the organ. And let's just, you know, let's, let's now talk also about the ovary side of things. So ovaries, very different to testes, right? I think we probably all intuitively have a sense for that. But if you were to cut through an ovary, um, you would see um, quite a dense tissue. There's a lot going on in there. And it's all very, very um, jam-packed. Whereas if you Actually, if you ever cut it, don't, I don't recommend you do this at home. But if you ever cut a testis, it's remarkable. Actually, they're really quite, um, <laughs> they're quite explosive, actually. They'll just really, they'll really expand. And all these tubules will come like pouring out. And it's these structures, these tubules are a bit like intestines, actually, weirdly, inside the testes. And that's where the, the sperm cells are matured. 
Okay, so this program here, this thing that happens, this sort of response, this interpretation of your chromosomal sex is called sex determination. It happens around eight weeks of development in humans. And it's really important because it basically makes your gonads. It, it, it then says, all right, we have this DNA. It's been here for eight weeks. Now, what are we going to do about it? Step one, build a gonad that's appropriate for the sex chromosomes we have, broadly speaking. Okay, so then you have the gonads. There's another layer of sex, biological sex, which is all the rest of the apparatus that's happening around there, right? It's not just gonads on their own. Testes are connected into the rest of the, the, the sort of urogenital system. Females in particular actually have um, obviously the uterus and the fallopian tubes and all these other things that are going on. There's a lot of ducting for pipe work. It needs to be plumbed in is what I'm trying to say, okay? So then, so that's the third layer. There's like everything else that's going on. And then comes um, another layer, which we call, you know, the, ge the genital system, basically. So that's like the aesthetics. What kind of sink are we putting there? What does this thing look like, right? Um, and what's really interesting is, um, actually, there can be, there's, well, there is a lot of variety, as we all know from our personal experiences, no doubt. Um, but also, medically speaking, that is, that is the layer at which there tends to be a bit more ambiguity. So about, about one in 10,000, one in 100,000, births, depending on where you are, when born, the doctors might take a look at the genitals and be not entirely sure of where it sits within that. So there's a bit more of a spectrum at that point in time. Okay. So that's, that's all pretty hardware style stuff that's going on. Now, um, another important part of this whole uh, system actually is the brain. Uh, I don't have a schematic. Oh no, I do. I do have a schematic for this. Bingo. Sorry, I should have put this up before. Here it is. We're past the watershed. It's all good. So um, there they are in their full glory. All of the this is all the hardware stuff that's going on. And um, what we well, yes, the last part of the, the biological sex system is the part where the brain has this little gland on the bottom of it called the pituitary and the brain um, signals to the pituitary and the pituitary also generates sex hormones. OK, so the last layer of biological sex is the hormones effectively. Well, yeah, the hormones that, that your system makes. And I haven't said this explicitly so far, so I'm going to. Um, your, your ovaries and your testes respectively house these important germ cells that will either become the sperm or the eggs. And this is, you know, these are the goods. These are the magical cells that will make the next generation. But they also produce hormones. And hormones are these molecules that go into your bloodstream and are sensed by every single cell in your body. Just take a moment to appreciate that, right? Hormones are these sort of pervasive signals that go through your entire body. And the, and the ovaries and the testes make these a lot of hormones but also your brain releases hormones. And there's this axis that exists between your brain signaling to your, um, your, your pituitary and then your pituitary releases hormones, which then signal to your gonads. And there's this whole feedback system that exists, which is magical. And of course, we all know that when children are born, they don't seem to be particularly, you know, they have genitals. Clearly they have the gonads, they have that, the hardware, but there is this sort of semi-software situation that happens that we call puberty, right? That, that when the system sort of really activates and then you start to see more systemic effects through the release of these hormones, right? They, they affect all of the cells in the body, but some respond. So females will get breasts, the males, the jaws will, you know, firm up and the bones will, will develop differently and vocal cords and various systems basically will have very obvious changes that happen, which is great. So we're here to talk about contraception because... Let's just think about it. So this is, that's biological sex. Well done, you're all experts now. That's how this all works. That's fascinating. But um, if you think about how humans, um, what we haven't said explicitly, and let's just get this over with, is, you know, okay, so I've talked about this very biologically. And, you know, of course, I would say as a biologist, the whole point of these systems is so that they can come together, bring together the egg cell and the sperm cell in this magical union, angels sing, and then the next generation comes out. Of course, we also know it's just fun, isn't it, having sex? It's not all about having babies. And humans have been doing that in time immemorial. And in fact, the, the good feelings and the enjoyment of it is evolution's little carrot on the stick. It's like, come on, you gotta, come on, you like this, don't you? Let's, let's have some babies. But actually, it's a bit of, a, it's not always the best to be constantly pregnant or having children. It's not always possible. It's, um, 
basically, I mean, maybe this is a bit of a judgment call here, but it's, it's became societally a little bit inconvenient. So humans have always known this, um, that, you know, the bit of, bit of fun happened. It took them a while to figure it out, but they did eventually figure out, you know, when, when the hanky-panky happens a little bit later, seems babies appear. So maybe we should be a bit careful about that. So that thus came the concept of contraception. So in its basic um, definition, contraception is a way of uncoupling reproduction from the sexual act, essentially. Okay. So in time, time immemorial, humans have been trying to do this thing. And, um, you know, we have these two different systems. And what's a really good way of doing it? Well, if you think about how humans might have looked at other humans' bodies and tried to figure out, all right, what are we going to do about this? Um, stop that. Whatever that, that stuff is that comes out of there, that's clearly got something to do with it. So put a sock, literally, or in the case of the Egyptians, a washed out um, intestine, also with a knot at the end. That'll do, you know, socks, sacks, blockage, blocking mechanisms have been used by humans as contraception, barrier methods, we call them, technically speaking, um, for a very long time. So that's, that was the original contraceptive, but obviously not, we can all tell, an intestine with a knot at the end of it, A, not particularly effective, B, a bit hard to come by, it might ruin the mood a little bit, don't mind me, I'm off to skin a cat and, you know, all this sort of stuff, not the best. So, but that exists. Um, Many years later, of course, people do uh, anatomy um, experiments and we learn a lot more about this internal system and various things happen. And so um, this leads me to, to saying, again, importantly in contraceptives, there's now two, two major divisions. There's the reversible kind, the kind where you can then remove said barrier, for example, or the irreversible, generally irreversible kind, which is called... Uh, yeah, the irreversible kind, which in the case of the males involves things like tube ligations, cutting, tying, you know, these kinds of things, things that now we know a lot more about these systems. Let's just, you know, prevent these sperm from being able to exit from, from the testes out again. So that's fascinating. But if you look at the male system, that's kind of about it, really. If you look at it, it's like, all right, sperm get made, they get shipped out, they come out at the end. Where can we stop this? Maybe stop the tubing or maybe put a stopper on it. That's one way of doing it. But the female system turns out, um, once we knew a lot more about it, of course, um, became uh, a site of many bright ideas. How many different ways can we stop this from happening? How many, how many different ways can we stop females from getting pregnant, right? That's the question. So of course, again, in the irreversible category or broadly irreversible category, the, the, tu the fallopian tubes are the equivalent to, to the vas deferens tubes there. So cutting, blocking, tying, ligating. Um, there's new technologies now involving bungs that you can stick in there, like surgical ones, obviously not, not rubber or, or anything like that. But, you know, good old fashioned blockage methods are good. Um, you know, caps, diaphragms, rings, things things to block this thing. Those things existed. They're called the barrier methods, generally speaking. They, they, they sort of fall into the sort of physically stop this from happening or like physically disjoining um, parts of the system. But you remember I said that there's this organ that sits at the bottom of the brain called the pituitary and it releases hormones. So what actually happened in, in some 50, well, more than 50 now, 70 years ago, People have been doing loads of experiments and, you know, studies on humans and looking for these hormones and what do they do and what's going on. And, and this, um, this shows a sort of summary of a whole load of information that people had found out, which was namely, well, it turns out, I hope you can all see this. So it turns out, obviously, menstruation and the fact that females menstruate has been known about for a long time. People have studied this. You know, there seems to be some sort of rhythmicity to it. There's a cycle. These things happen. You know, basically the lining sort of thickens up. It's there, it's ready. It seems to correlate with an approximate time at which you could get pregnant. If no pregnancy occurs, of course, the lining sheds and out it comes. Then people started learning also about, you know, in parallel, separate scientists, presumably, started learning about all these hormones that are happening. And then we find out that there's these hormones called estrogens, progesterones. There's also many other hormones, famously also testosterone, of course, we know about in males, but everybody has um, a bit of all of them, actually. It's just to do with the relative levels of them. And then when you sort of start to overlay these bits of information, so estrogen, progesterone, for example, then you start to see things like, oh, there's patterns. There's like a relationship there between what we see is happening in the uterus and with the lining and when it's shedding and the relative levels of the hormones. Um, 
just for completeness sake, I'll also highlight the upper one, which is um, there's a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone and another one called luteinizing hormone. And there's um, ovulation basically happens when you have this sort of buildup of estrogen followed by this huge peak of what's called luteinizing hormone that helps trigger this sort of release of, of eggs. Okay. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.